And I went to a DrupalCon recently, and one of the things that, that struck me was that somebody was like, yeah, and the best thing about this is, you know, and you don't have to do any SQL. And they said in the same tone of voice of, and no human sacrifice. <laughs> you know, you know, I, I mean, the, 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 the sort of, you know, equivalent of, of no SQL equals no cannibalism. <laughs> you know, where, where it's this a priori thing that SQL is so bad that anything that allows you to avoid it is therefore good. Um, and, you know, and so I started talking to some people about how do we get in this case, you know, it's not just a case of, you know, yeah, it's obviously teaching people, you know, how to actually write SQL and that sort of thing and how to use it and that sort of thing, but I think we're actually at the point where the biggest thing that we have to teach a large segment of the developer public is to just not hate and fear it. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, so that in cases where, you know, they need to bypass the ORM or they need to do something else or, um, you know, that they're not choosing inappropriate databases based on this, this litmus test of do I have to use doesn't involve us well um, the uh, So I wanted to see, I mean, I had some thoughts about what led us to uh, the, the hate and fear SQL, but I wanted to get many of people had thoughts about turning them around. Um, so some of the stuff, because like we were, you know, talking about this in some various conferences and like, one of the things that we realized that people were running into um, was the way, so it was a, it was a number of, of problems actually, that sort of what developed with it. One was that a lot of that is, is actually there in that word. Which is for a big part of that community, what web developer actually often seems to mean is <coughs> that what we did developer often seems to mean is, is that somebody's web developer because they're not a programmer. Um, so, like for example, I met Drupal South and I discovered that the majority of the people who are there don't actually even write PHP. They just write CSS and install Drupal plugin modules in order to build sites. So um, that's that's one of the problems that we're seeing with with SQL. So for for this group of people, it's not that SQL is a bad programming language or something. It's that it's a programming language. Um, for another. You know, for another group of people, that there's this sort of background of learning SQL, which is that there's sort of the way a lot of people have been taught SQL, particularly if they learned it on the job, is um, as a command language or an API. So, you know, they're, they're taught um, they're taught SQL like it's the original DOS. This is how you retrieve your data. This is the, the API of the set of commands to retrieve your data, and not a programming language. And so then when they run up against a problem that makes it obvious that SQL is a programming language, they um, they freak out and they're like, you know, what is this horrible thing? Um, so that's one of the issues. Um, another issue that I've noticed actually is. Um, And we particularly have this in our community, in the Postgres community, is DBA attitude. The because um, I've seen a lot of SQL help being given the uh, under the thing of um, you know this is how you do it correctly. Stupid is is that that's the help being provided um, or the, the way the training is being provided. The, of course you should know this. And all that incorrect. Yeah. So 
I mean, those, those are the biggest problem I'm seeing that, that's leading to the sort of hate and fear SQL. So, does anybody have any other feedback before we get on to ideas? Well, I would just say that, yeah, I mean, I, my experience with Java programmers is that a lot of them are afraid of SQL and they just don't understand it. They don't work on it all that much. Uh, they spend most of their time in Java, or uh, some other people spend most of their time in PHP, and they're also doing front end, so they're doing jQuery. And SQL is just this other language that's not similar. It's <coughs> Yeah, but as a parallel, <clears throat> Despite being, say, Java programmers, an awful lot of Java programmers know enough HTML to get by fairly well. That is, they may prefer writing a JavaScript to generate the HTML, but they know enough HTML to know what to generate. And HTML is obviously pretty radically different. You know, it's a markup language, it's very different. You know, for that matter, a lot of Java programmers are completely you know XML. Yeah. Um, well, I think they think of the Right. You know, like the developer yeah. pulling out and saying, yeah, you can see that. Yeah. Like, right. it's some mystical thing that I know how to right. query. Yeah. You know, whereas the same person will write up a really complex XML doc, XLST expression yeah. to get, you know, five elements out of a ridiculous XML document um, or turn it into a PDF for, for this one. I, um, I don't think it's particularly different than a lot of people being able to do HTML well, but when it comes to doing really hardcore core and very good CSS, uh, a lot of people can't do it well. And, and since they don't do it much, there's fear. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not on the front end much. Maybe somewhere there's a bunch of Apache guys discussing how can we get people to be less afraid of CSS. Uh, I'm afraid of CSS. Um, the, um, <laughs> my attitude is, hello, Eris? <laughs> I need some CSS. The, uh, yeah. What about the, the mismatch between kind of object models and the relational model of the database? Do you think that affects the way that? Yeah, so the, um, I mean, the issue is that it is a different, I mean, the biggest issue is that it's a different mode of thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly, you know, not necessarily, uh, the storage models are not such an issue. It's actually more of an issue going from, um, a procedural way of handling activities to a declarative way of handling activities. Um, and that, um, I find that's actually more of a, of, a, of a real problem than the storage model issue is. Um, the, also, the other big real problem is trying to transition from thinking about everything as being in memory and instantly accessible to the fact that you have data and objects that are not in memory or instantly accessible. Um, and that's also where I find that object-oriented programs really run into trouble. They write their programs with the idea that, you know, they write things, because particularly actually if you do some of the self-modifying languages like Moody, is that the sort of assumption with your ability to, um, uh, what do they call it, uh, uh, duct typing, to, to modify an object that's already in use by other threads on the fly really doesn't think about the fact that um, some of the objects you're trying to modify may have already been serialized to disk and be across the network and stored somewhere else. And suddenly you've got to retrieve your entire database in the network. <coughs> the, uh, so I find those, yeah, those are, those are actually real issues and it's, it's the sort of mental issue of suddenly thinking about stuff. The retrieval model, thinking about picking their object-oriented program is really, what I'm saying is, when it comes down to it, they're not thinking about how do I do this particular task with the least work. Um, that's, not, that's not one of their design considerations of doing something with the least work. The design consideration is, how do I do this and make it fit into my object model? How do I do this in an elegant or fun or interesting way? How do I um, do this in a way that I know how to do it? Yeah, yes. Um, so, yeah, well, we've also got, so we have um, they, they, that's the so called impedance. <clears throat> so, that's another issue. And, uh, and like I said, my, my experience that when I actually work directly with developers is that the impedance is not 
the technical matter of storage, which is how it's usually expressed in people's blogs, but the mental matter of changing fonts um, from, from one model to another. Um, and the, um, so, but again, presumably that, that particular impedance exists with a Java developer who's trying to write CSS, for example, because that's also changing models. Um, and, and maybe they're getting an equal amount of uh, carbon emissions, I don't know. So the question is, do we have any ideas about ways that database geeks could be dealing with some of these problems to make um, application developers interested in at least learning as much SQL as they need in order to write their applications. Most of my developers actually I know SQL fairly well, um, but that I think is because in the past uh, the number of DBAs has been very, very small. Managers need to know more. 
There's too many managers who just don't know databases and don't know uh, the flow of things. What does big enterprise do with this? Or are they just as bad as uh, what we start off? <coughs> yeah, it just happens on a departmental basis. Mm -hmm. and usually with big enterprises, you have a lot more money to keep throwing at the problem, so you don't care about spending the developer time to buy more hardware. I've never encountered that before. So any ideas on making say, learning enough SQL to get by um, I, and uh, more palatable for developers? Yes, yeah, so I've got one that actually works. Yeah. It, it's a terror program. Having somebody look over my shoulder while I write code and I explain to them why I'm doing what I'm doing. I found that that is actually a really good way to do it. It seems, you know, somewhat dull for the person Well, a smaller extent, code review, I think, is good because one of the problems I have is I write all this SQL. Nobody even, no other, nobody else on my team even sees your code as long as it works. Right. So at least doing code reviews, if, you know, if you don't want to commit to fair programming, doing code reviews so they at least have their eyes on the code. I, I put down code reviews. Code reviews are very similar. Language, not a language, often what you're doing is iterating. 
and that's exactly what you don't want to do in SQL. Um, but it's pretty natural if you've been writing iterative code up until 3 p.m. and you need to write a query at 3 p.m. you're going to write the iterative query. I wonder if um, more people learning Lisp would help. The way <laughs> oh, right, yeah, that's it, right? Can we can find, yeah, because we can find something that people hate more than SQL. <laughs> <laughs> no, that could be good, right? It's similar. It trains the mind a little bit in terms of how the data flows. Actually, any functional programming language would probably program. do that. Yeah. Sorry? Any functional language would probably do that reasonably yeah. well, although they're yeah. probably all equally hateable. So, yeah, and that's actually, and that may be a way because we have some new functional languages like Erlang that are getting a lot more popular. So, So, I mean, Link in C Sharp and, and .NET technologies uh, actually is basically functional programming on top of an SQL-like syntax. Okay. Which could be useful as an entry point. LANQ, if you know it. Yeah. What is Mongo written in? Or what, how do you query Mongo? Well, it's not SQL. It's not SQL, although people have written translators. It's, a, it's, got, a, it's got a custom query language uh, simpler than SQL, but uh, uh, Annotated in something that looks like okay. JSON. Okay. Um, uh, does uh, the Mongo language have as many issues with developers as SQL does? Well, I missed the first part of this discussion. What issues do you mean? It doesn't have the performance <laughs> stuff. Well, okay, that they're not programmer. Web developers aren't programmers. So the thing is that the document. So, yes. I don't want to hijack anything that you asked, so yeah. to try to keep it short. Um, it doesn't have the uh, performance things where you can write a query that takes forever to happen because we don't have fancy uh, joins or you know aggregation or whatever. But the uh, the other thing is that we encourage people to store their documents in roughly the way that they want to see them. So a lot of things are just different. Um, on the other hand, we don't get to show people we don't have any anything resembling uh, you know um, different ways of looking at the same data. You can do projects, but that's about it. So. Just to clarify what's on your board, lose the attitude means, you mean lose the uh, object role models attitude? Is that what you mean? No, lose the attitude towards develop, because this is a problem coming from the database professional side of things, the, the SQL database professional side of things, is I see a lot of attitude towards, um, towards web developers, towards ORMs, towards people who don't know SQL already. Um, and it's not at all helpful in getting developers interested in SQL. I mean, because you sort of, yeah, I've seen lots of cases where somebody comes on a chat channel or whatever and they want help with a relatively simple query. And the help is provided, but with the, the here's how to write that correctly, stupid. Right. Yeah. Uh, SQL people don't, uh, often don't recognize uh, uh, how people think in object role model mode and how that clashes with the database mode of doing things. And I think that's what they need to teach each other. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the developers like object role models, so right. object-oriented language, and the SQL database people, that's sort of an alien uh, idea in some respects. So I think the two sides have to teach each other uh, their particular viewpoints. So you could actually even say things like ideas of this pair program should actually go both ways. That's right. So it's not just the, the object program that will move your shoulder if you write SQL, it's you will move over their shoulder with the writing application code. <coughs> yeah, and I think those last, the bottom two points yeah. speak to that. The, the, yeah. is the database people need to understand, oh, wow. right. you know, oh, the developers need to understand functional languages. Right. And I think in a lot of cases, a, a successful SQL programmer is somebody who is exposed to functional languages early, who maybe even learned about databases you know, in a university setting rather than just trying to figure out SQL. One of my questions here, does anybody currently have a lot of involvement with universities? Well, I mean, like Bradley does. Yeah. Yeah. Because the, the, uh, the question is, one of the things that I, I also saw in the last decade was that the quality, the average quality of university database courses in the U.S. took a big plunge. 
you know, the the thing with like, I saw somebody, you know, basically the course that was taught, you know, out of like the CJD textbook, but not the current one out of the original one from the eighties, without like updated information, because they, you know, the, the database professors all took kind of sabbaticals to work on startups and. The person assigned to teach the database course was actually the guy who normally teaches graphics programming. Um, you know, what is he going to do? The, um, and, and I'm actually wondering whether or not that's still true. Um, and, and particularly what students are being taught for, you know, the database, the, for example, the entry level database class that's mandatory often for CS grants. What is it they're being taught in that class? So I, I took one of those a couple of years ago at Cornell and the first half of it was relational algebra. Every now and again, he'd slur SQL as a language. And then the second half of it was XML. So that, that, this is part of the problem. That's a theory course. That's a theory course. No, no, that, that, was, that, was, that was supposed to be for database professionals. No, no, I understand. But what I'm saying is that's, in, in actuality, that's a theory course. Because well, yeah. that completely describes a course that I took that was theoretical, you know, as an undergrad kind of thing. Yeah. The, the other thing that I've seen actually is, is problem classes and very frequently is that if you have the single class, um, the single class will be effectively how to use a workflow or how to use DB2 with, with no theoretical or even general point, you know, that's the, the professor actually will be somebody who is an IBM employee yeah. who's, who's teaching DB2 effectively. And so students don't learn the difference you know, between database systems or how to use it generically and they spend as much time on how to install the software as they do on how to actually use the database. Um, so, so one of my questions there, you know, because particularly actually have seen this, this is a, a national thing because I've seen this when we were hiring database staff at Sun, we had to hire out of country. We simply could not, we did not get resumes from qualified candidates who were for positions in California. So we had to age would be people from India and China that were actually learning how to write databases. Um, uh, again, and we're not here. It's extraordinarily hard to hire DBAs. No, it's extraordinarily hard to hire good DBAs. Um, we don't get many applications. Like really? That up. Yeah. Well, as a, as a professor, uh, I was born in Drexel because they didn't have the quality of database class that we yeah. all think they should have. Yeah. Um, there was a guy who was <coughs> being able to work for the Pep Boys, which was a yeah. auto thing. Um, he just knew he didn't have the skill. Yeah. So basically, it's an alpha stress based class. And, you know, we teach a little theory and then we teach the SQL and then we go into a lot of the yeah. you know, hands on stuff. So that that actually would be one of those, but that leads to an idea, which is that maybe some of us, you know, who don't mind teaching, particularly since we do a lot of presentations anyway, should be looking for uni and extension and community college classes that we can teach. We get paid for it. It's not not like programming, but be a nice change of pace. I have difficulty I had with that um, because the uh, Berkeley extension people like want to teach to class is because they're a graduate degree they can't allow me to. Um, and that's actually one of the problems that run with DBAs because my experience actually knowing a lot of DBAs is that an awful lot of DBAs are self-taught programmers rather than having the CS background. And many don't have bachelor degrees at all. And then, and then it becomes a difficulty with the classes, you know, because they just they they don't they have a standard to maintain in terms of accredited faculty, regardless of what you know from industry knowledge. But there are some schools, like for example, in San Francisco, we have SF State, and SF State is specifically sort of vocationally oriented, and so they actually care more about your work background than they do about your know, university credentials. And there's probably other schools like that, you know, in any sort of major city. Yeah, what, what they told me, I have a master's in education, and they, they, they basically said we could go with, I mean, I, they, we could go without the graduate degree. Right. I said, if you never graduate, we could, you know, I said, it's good to have it, it helps us, but yeah. at Drexel, it wasn't, it wasn't. Really. 
So, so here's a question. Like, I mean, for example, in, in your course, which sounds like a disaster area, um, would it because like my attitude would be if I managed to actually hook up with one of these is to actually teach people not here's relational theory, but do the we're going to build an application. You know, we're going to build like a simple content management application that runs in an SQL database. Yeah, and, and then if you're going to teach, you know, like how to do joins, then first you go, let's do a join, and this is how that works. Um, I mean, would you have found that more helpful? Well, I mean, I was already pretty familiar with things. I took it mostly just yeah, okay. for credits. But the, the impression that I got, this isn't a direct answer to your question. The impression that I got was that that it was a research university. The yeah. researchers there were treating uh, relational databases as a mostly solved problem. And the hot thing that they were getting money for was what was an XML database. Right. So well, that was, yeah, that was actually, I have, I have a lovely, because when I do my little presentation on, on, you know, new types of databases, um, which are not actually new types of databases, but the, the renaissance of non-relational databases, one of the things I point out is I have some great quotes from professors mm -hmm. in 2001 predicting um, the triumph of XML databases over all other types of databases. You know, 2001 will mark the end of relational databases and the new dominance of XML databases. Right. Um, the, um, and so you do, get, you do get that. I think you need to find a more vocationally oriented environment to actually focus on practical realities. Yeah. I actually learned uh, MySQL originally uh, from a class, a PHP MySQL class. There was a book. Uh, and it, was, yeah, um, doing mobile exercises and building an application. Um, and it was nothing amazing, but it taught me enough PhD to get a job making 13 bucks an hour. And uh, enough of my school that I could keep up and got me a start. So I may have missed it, but have you addressed the possibility that you might just need a certain bent of mind? Like SQL? Right, well, so there's the, the thing is that so the beginning of this was we were talking about um, not necessarily that we expect like, you know, every PHP and Ruby developer and stuff out there to suddenly also become an SQL thing, but to more to remove the, the barrier of hate and fear and avoidance to say, look, if this is a task for SQL, I'm going to learn enough SQL to accomplish this task. And what, I, what I've been finding is that, that people are not, you know, this has to involve SQL. A certain substantial portion of um, particularly web developers are, if this task involves SQL, I'm not going to do it. Um, and, and that's a real problem because, you know, uh, the, because uh, it's, it's an irrational response. And it also, you know, results in, uh, in some cases, people will And also, you know, um, technologies have, good technologies in the past have disappeared because of becoming unpopular for reasons that had nothing to do with technology. I find it hard to think of SQL going away. Sure. Ever. Um, it's just too damn useful. Um, and too many big, big companies use it constantly, every day, for all of their mission-critical stuff. Yeah. Well, but, you know, there's still an awful lot of COBOL abuse. And more, more than anyone wants to talk about. But that doesn't mean people are writing new stuff in COBOL. Yeah. Well, there's uh, several companies, Screenbase uh, comes to mind, that are using SQL to do basically inference engine. Yeah. Uh, stuff for stock trading and other uh, computer driven uh, Yeah. So, well, and that's actually, so actually, that was one of the questions is, is some of the new stuff, you know, so the new, some of the new extended SQL that we're getting for some of these other types of databases that are using SQL anyway. Um, or an SQL, a, a fourth of SQL, they're using some SQL commands, combined with some of their own commands. Does that actually make, does that make SQL more attractive to 
somebody who is not a professional database keeper is going to be less attractive. And to solve the problem, because it just depends on the context. Mm -hmm. Don't you go the other way and say, what can we do to keep SQL away from the web developer? Yeah. As opposed to getting more involved in that. Right? I, I think that's an important ORM point. ORM you, yeah, exactly. That's well, focus on the ORMs and yeah. you know different types of data stores. Yeah. If the ORM is not horrific, and if you can deal with uh, the worst issues by hand. Yeah, and if you have the capacity to be able to deal with it when the developer comes over and goes, it's not working, fix it. Well, the database is broken. But when you're assuming you're in a situation where there's a DBA available. I see the the web developer not being a programmer is, you know, almost a positive thing in that it, it enables all these ORMs and, and whatnot, enables him to do stuff that he couldn't possibly do in the past. Well, the web developers who aren't programmers go out, they get hosting from someone, and I end up being their DBA, working for a hosting provider. Mm -hmm. uh, and that doesn't make, that doesn't resolve the problem because uh, if they do enough stupid stuff, we're going to shut down their account or take some action. Um, well, the big thing, and the big thing is the sort of level of frustration, which is that because they, because most ORMs are not particularly well written, um, and they either depend on the ORM or they try to do their own ad hoc SQL without really understanding it or treating it as, you know, for example, a data retrieval API. Um, I guess my point would be like, well, okay, maybe they are and they're mature. Let's focus on that. I'm sure there was a day when people said, oh, this SQL, it's, it's, it's not that good, you know, but, you know, in time, you know, I, I just think right. taking you're, SQL out of the equation really you're right, enables but these, these web developers. You're right, but the thing is, ORMs are made by developers, not SQL people, because uh, by definition, we're not developers, right? right? We're doing SQL, so it's a hard thing to do to say, we need someone to program. No, I, I, someone programs the database. So I, I think that, I mean, the actual, whatever is running against yeah. the SQL. Right. So I think well, no, there's, a, there's a lot of people who know both. So, so a lot of these are open source projects, and they probably, you know, were developed by programmers, these ORMs, but <coughs> they could, you know, conceivably, a DBA type person could go in there and say, you know, let's, let's work on this and make it better, because we've noticed. Right. You know, I mean, even, even one yeah. third person says, look, you know, this, this ORM just brought down our server because it does these things the wrong way. Let me help contribute to your project and make yeah. these types of queries better. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and then, yeah, with, with that top part, it, it helps a lot with that issue. Exactly. I mean, I, I see these ORMs going crazy all the time with, but, <laughs> you know, the, the SQL log and, and um, right, so why not focus on that so then the developer doesn't have to worry about SQL, he can worry about his task at hand. Uh, and that's actually what I say. One of the things about losing losing the attitude yeah. would really help because you know again, if you go to the developer and you say ORMs are evil, period, stop. Right. There's no way to progress from them. A, a lot of the issues that I've seen with ORMs is that you know when you start using the access object that ends up in a round trip time to the database that could be an, an expensive query, programmers start using these things as if they're immediate operations. Right. So it's not just making. And they are. Work. They test it in their laptop. So, so, so it's hard to, to necessarily solve that in the ORM too, unless you start doing some crazy predictive behavior in the ORM of like, okay, this person just made this call to this one object. They're probably going to get the next hundred objects over this. Let me cache those in a single query, stuff like that. And it, and it gets really tricky to know what exactly is the program going to do because we don't know what their code is. So we can do some things to make the ORMs better, but until we you know, start doing some really crazy prediction algorithms. I want to just augment something that I think has been discussed. As a person who has formerly worked in SQL and is now working on a thing that isn't, we at MongoDB, we're also beset with horrible ORMs, except they're called ODMs. And they're just as bad and just as, well, they are just as lousy as users of our database as ORMs are for relational databases. But in our experience with our customers, um, they like these things on a theory that these, these extra layers give them some insulation uh, of something, of some sort. Like it, they're bent, they, they think that so RMs aren't going to go away, is I guess the, 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 the basic point. Yes. Of and exactly the same way that SQL isn't going to go away. Right. And I don't think that the kind of people who are going to reach for an RM out of the box are the sort of people that are going to easily be persuaded to use anything else. Well, so maybe that's the answer. 
And I'll tell you, unfortunately, from, from personal experience, that not, not all ORM projects are equally open to contributions from database developers. But, so I think it would actually be a combination of contributing to the projects that are, because I mean, particularly, I've had a lot of issues with the Django ORM. Um, in there. Um, they're not talking about swapping SQL <coughs> over I think I will actually give a fork of the project. Anyway, the um, so so it would actually be a combination of you know helping the ORMs that that want to improve improve and then putting you know recommending those ORMs strong, you know, saying, okay, well, you know, SQL Alchemy really is the best Python ORM from a database perspective, the database geeks ought to be saying that. Um, the, uh, and, and also when helping modify the ARMs, not just like, oh, tweaking the SQL that is generating the backend, but also the, the APIs that the ORMs expose, that can make a world of difference. If you don't allow an API to do something stupid, then the yeah. programmer is not going to be able to. They're going to look for that other way to use it, knowing that I'm going to use this ORM regardless. Yeah. How, how do I do this thing? If you only give them one thing to do it, you, know, you can uh, affect their behavior that way. Right. So they're like method calls, for example, that ask for batches. Yes. Don't allow, you know, single, single row, unless they really need it somehow, but, you know, yeah. find ways to design great API to prevent that type of behavior. Okay, anything else? The end of the time slider. We can start with a new meme that SQL is cool again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can do fun stuff. I mean, the other thing is, the other, actually, the other, here's one other thing that I saw at work, um, which, um, believe it or not, is um, the, I forget, who is it? Somebody did this great presentation at OSCOM two years ago where he demonstrated solving Sudoku puzzles using Pure SQL. And that presentation was packed. And there aren't enough database geeks that go to OSCOM for those to all be database people. So, the, uh, so I think that's also is that there's a lot of focus on the sort of bread and butter stuff, but particularly if you have access to any of the recent, you know, bizarre extensions of the SQL standard, you can actually do interesting things. Um, like the, who was it, we did the Fibonacci series using yeah, recursive CTEs? Yeah, they did the, you know, they did the, the Mondo bra and the Christmas tree. Yeah. That was... Uh, Feather did the traffic sales. Yeah. So, the, uh, you know, that's not necessarily directly applicable, but, you know, would, would help, I think, change the image of SQL of being something that you have to put on a tie before you start writing. A tie? Which I think we have, actually. Of course it's that. Yeah. For these things. That was one of the funerals. Right. Yeah. Okay. This is so many.